Hello and welcome to our first video lesson on Chapter 3, From Genes to Proteins. In this lesson we'll be considering briefly the structure of nucleotides and the basic structure of DNA. Let me just remind you that nucleic acids are polymers of nucleotides, and so let's look at those structures first. We can classify them based on the identity of the base which is attached to the sugar, and we can classify them in one of two ways. First of all, purine nucleotides resemble the chemical base purine as illustrated here, and those include adenine and guanine. And then we have pyrimidine bases, and those include cytosine and thymine, and they resemble the chemical base pyrimidine. Let me just reassure you, you don't have to know the individual structures of the four nucleotides, but you should be able to recognize a base as a purine or pyrimidine. Let me also point out the numbering system here. As you can see on the far right, it's a very simple numbering system. We number those atoms with whole integers just to indicate the number that we're of the atom that we're referring to in the base. There's one difference between DNA and RNA as far as the base. In DNA, there's a thymine base. In RNA, that is replaced with uracil. Of course, the major difference between DNA and RNA has to do with the identity of the sugar to which they're attached. In the case of RNA, it's ribose, pictured on the lower left. And in DNA, it's deoxyribose, pictured on the lower right. Let me point out the numbering system here for the sugar. In order to distinguish these atoms from those in the base, we put a little prime with those numbers. So we have the 1 prime, 2 prime, 3 prime, and so forth positions. Notice for ribose, that's part of RNA, we have a 2 prime OH, whereas in DNA, we're missing an oxygen at that 2 prime position, and that's why it's called deoxyribose. Just a little note on terminology. Recall that nucleosides are sugars with bases attached but with no phosphates. As we start to add one or more phosphates, those nucleosides become nucleotides. All of the structures illustrated here are nucleotides. On notation, we say that CTP is a nucleotide triphosphate or an NTP. That is, it's a ribose sugar, an oxy sugar. However, if it's a deoxy version, we put a small d in front of it and call that a DNTP. All of the ones illustrated here are NTPs. Notice we have guanosine diphosphate, so we say that that is a nucleoside diphosphate. That is to say it's a nucleoside to which two phosphates have been added. CTP at the bottom of the screen is a nucleoside triphosphate. Both of these are nucleotides. I also want to point out that there are nucleotides that aren't part of DNA, such as NAD, nicotinamide adenine dinucleotide, illustrated here. It has two adenine bases in it. These are often important as cofactors or participants in reactions, and so we'll be seeing these as we go through the semester as well. Now, DNA is a polymer of nucleotides, and they're joined together by phosphodiester bonds. Remember, an ester bond is a C double bond O, OR bond, but in this case we have phosphorus, so it's a phosphoester. And since we have one phospho connecting uh, two nucleotides together, it's a phosphodiester. Notice in the polymer, there is a directionality to it. So there's a 5 prime N, there's a phosphate connected to the 5 prime carbon of that ribose, and in the, at the 3 prime end we have an OH. So these nucleotides are joined together by bringing a 5 prime phosphate together with a 3 prime OH, but we'll be looking at DNA synthesis later. The convention is to read the sequence from the 5' prime to the 3' prime end because that is the order in which they are connected. Now we want to look at the nature of the DNA double helix that forms. It forms by base pairing between a purine and a pyrimidine. It's always a purine and pyrimidine pair, and they're referred to as Watson-Crick base pairs or canonical base pairs. So here we have adenine base pairing with thymine, and that is to say we have hydrogen bonds that are connecting them. Remember, the dotted highlighted line indicates a hydrogen bond. In the case of A and T base pairs, we have two hydrogen bonds, and in the case of G and C, we have three hydrogen bonds. 
You'll notice though, since it's always a purine and pyrimidine, the dimensions of those structures are always the same. It's about 11 angstroms. And so when we form the double helix, we find that the distance between the sugar phosphate backbones of each of those monomers that are brought together are the same distance apart if we were to flatten the molecule out. So it's a very consistent structure. However, of course, actually there's a twist to the DNA. It's not a flat structure. And so we want to look a little bit more at that. Let's review briefly this rule of ATGC base pairs. This is called Chargaff's rule. And that means that if we measure the number of bases of A and G, G, that is the purine nucleotides, that is equivalent to the number of pyrimidine nucleotides. This was the first indication that it's always a purine and pyrimidine pair. In our next lesson we want to look at how DNA forms this double-stranded structure, why is that the most stable structure, and what is it that contributes to the stability of that DNA double helix.